Today, we are in lesson 11 of how to study the Bible. And uh, if you are watching or listening to this online, like always, you can find a link in the description of the lesson where you can download, you can print out the worksheet that we're working on here in the class. And uh, at the end of each lesson, we always look over the questions that are in the worksheet. So last time we finished looking at word meanings and relationships. We had about two weeks of uh, English class there for a little bit. And uh, we looked at verbs, we looked at adjectives, we looked at adverbs and conjunctions. We also looked at how to analyze word relationships. And so today we're going to start looking at principles about language. And our focus in this lesson is going to be literal and figurative language and simple comparisons in interpreting figures of speech. And I'm going to give you guys some more homework. And uh, you can practice interpreting figures of speech on your own time. But before we get into that, I want to review our homework from last time. This was practicing word meanings and relationships. So let's look at this right quick. So first, looking at our practice identifying verbs. The objective was to underline the 15 verbs in John 4, 1 through 6. And I'll just go through those quickly. Um, you, can, you can look at your paper. Uh, they are heard, was gaining, baptizing, was, baptized, learned, left, went, go, came, head given, was, was, sat, and was. Then on the second part, you were to underline the adjectives by the nouns in the adjacent three sentences. So in the first one, it was gentle south. In the second one, it was dear and fellow. And then in the last one, it was great. Third, you were to answer the question about the verse. What is the purpose of the connecting word in Matthew 4.4? 4? And its purpose is to show contrast. Finally, you were to answer the questions about the verses in Ephesians 4, 11 through 13. So first, the five types of people or gifts Jesus gave are apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Second, Jesus gave these five types of gifts to the church to prepare God's people for works of service and so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity. So let's go ahead and get into our lesson. So we're going to be looking first today at learning about literal and figurative language. So all people share some common rules of etiquette, such as being kind and thankful. But there are specific social rules that vary from place to place. For instance, uh, in many cultures, they may vary in the way that they serve drinks to people. So one culture, like um, our culture, a lot of our culture today, would consider it polite to serve a guest to drink soon after they arrive, right? Somebody comes to your house, they they come in, they sit down, what's what's one of the first things? Would you like something to, to drink, right? Would you like a, a glass of water or, or something to drink? Um, in contrast, there are many cultures who do not 
offer a drink until a guest has had a meal and is getting ready to leave. So if one man from the first culture invited a man from the second culture to his home, just imagine what this would look like. When the host offered his guest coffee soon after he arrived, the guest might be in shock because he didn't correctly interpret what was going on, right? He might think, man, this guy's getting ready to shove me out the door, right? Uh, so in, in his culture, coffee came at the end of a visit. And so the guest might think that the host wants him to, to leave, right? And see, if you ever come to my house, I'll just tell you, I want you to leave. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so the Bible also has general and specific rules. And in previous lessons, we've studied general rules about the historical cultural background, about the circles of literary context, and about word relationships. But in this lesson, we're going to begin to study some specific rules. And some refer to these rules as special hermeneutics. So the purpose of the Bible is to clarify, right? The, the purpose of the Bible is God revealing himself to us, right? Letting us know him more. And a lot of times we get this idea in... Uh, in our head, and, and, and you see this promoted a lot, that there's like really deep uh, hidden mysteries within the Bible, and, and you, you have to uh, search out these hidden mysteries and uh, open your can of alphabet soup and dump it out and see what, what spelled out and that sort of thing, right? But the purpose of the Bible is to clarify. It's not to confuse, Right? God doesn't want to confuse us. He wants us to know him. He's not trying to uh, play mind tricks on us or, or anything like that. God gave us scripture to reveal himself and his will to mankind. So scripture is not a collection of like dark mysteries or hidden riddles. It is a plain message from God to humanity. So when you are interpreting a text, the first thing that we need to do is look for the plainest meaning. This is the one that is the most obvious. This is the one that is just natural and simple. A lot of times, um, I, I don't know if you guys have ever met anyone like this. Um, you give this person a project, right? And they will spend seven hours trying to figure out how to do this simple project instead of just doing it, right? They'll, they'll spend seven hours trying to plot and plan what's the best way to, to tackle this thing instead of just, just going for it, right? And a lot of times uh, we, we can get confused and if, if we try to put too much thought into what is being said, we can miss the real point of what is being said. So sometimes the language of scripture is literal. It is exact. And there are other times when it is figurative or symbolic. So we're gonna look at literal language, figurative language, and how we can discern between the two. So to define literal language, it is plain, direct, common speech. It is straight and it is to the point. It's, it's not a bunch of symbols or hidden meanings or anything like that in literal language. So we're going to look at an example of this in the scriptures. In Acts chapter 20, verses... 7 through 12, this is what it tells us. 
On the first day of the week, we came together to break bread. Paul spoke to the people, and because he intended to leave the next day, he kept on talking until midnight. There were many lamps in the upstairs room where we were meeting. Seated in a window was a young man named Eutychus, who was sinking into a deep sleep as Paul talked on and on. When he was sound asleep, he fell to the ground from the third story and was picked up dead. Paul went down, threw himself on the young man, and put his arms around him. Don't be alarmed, he said. He is alive. Then he went upstairs again and broke bread and ate. After talking until daylight, he left. The people took the young man home alive and were greatly comforted. So, looking at this passage, don't get caught up in things like midnight, right? Don't ask, what does midnight represent, right? What what deep hidden mystery is, is within midnight? It doesn't represent anything, right? Luke was just telling us what time it was, okay? Likewise, don't ask what what the lamps were. Why was there so many lamps? What was what was the meaning behind all the lamps? Well, they wanted to see. Right? What do we have? We got a bunch of lights in here. Why? Cuz we want to see what's going on. Uh don't ask about the three stories. Don't ask about the window. Don't ask about the deep sleep or or what Eutychus may represent. They don't represent anything secret, right? Each word means what it says. Um, There there isn't any secret symbols or hidden mysteries or anything like that in this passage. It teaches that believers met together to share the Lord's Supper. Paul talked on and on. Imagine that, a pastor just going on and on and on. This this kid, Eutychus, went to sleep, and he fell out of the window. Well, he probably shouldn't have been sitting on the windowsill if he was tired, right? So then the fall killed him, and God performed a miracle when Paul held Eutychus, and he came back to life. There was one preacher who once compared worldly Christians to this kid, Eutychus. Okay, And he said that as Eutychus slept too close to an open window, some Christians stay too close to sin. Okay, Now, he was using the passage as an illustration. And you can teach that he was, that he was sleepy, but don't go making stuff up about him being worldly. The Bible doesn't say anything about him being worldly, right? What does it say? Paul was talking on and on and on, and the kid fell asleep and fell out the window. That's what it says. So just as Jesus used salt and light and sheep and and things like this to illustrate truth, Christians can use the Bible to illustrate truth. However, if you want to give an example of worldly Christians... That's not a good passage to use, okay? Don't take your main text from Acts 27 through 12. The text is not about worldly Christians, even if maybe you could spin it to where it seems like it is. It's not. Instead, if you want to give an example of worldly Christians, you should use a passage like 1 Corinthians 3.1. This would be a good verse to use. Let's look at what this says. It makes much more sense. It tells us, Brothers and sisters, I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit, but what? As people who are still worldly. Mere infants in Christ. Right? So let's look at another example of literal language found in Matthew. In Matthew 17, 1, 
It says, After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. So, once again, we see plain language, right? No, no hidden mysteries in the alphabet soup. Matthew 17, 1 records that Peter, James, and John climbed a mountain with Jesus. This is literal language. Uh, the word mountain is not a symbol for something else, right? Uh, so, so don't try to make the mountain represent something different from just a physical rocky hill that these guys climbed. It's not. In this verse, we understand the word mountain in a literal sense. Why? Because if we try to make it something else, we're going to misinterpret the whole thing, right? We're going we're gonna to make something up. So in this case, the natural meaning is the literal meaning. Now, let's take a look at some figurative language. So you must interpret plain speech in a plain way, or you will not understand it. In contrast, you must discern that some verses do use symbols and hidden meanings, or you might stumble. So let's look at some examples in the book of Revelation. Looking at Revelation 17, we're looking at verse 1. Verse 15 and verse 18. This is what we read. One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and said to me, Come, I will show you the punishment of the great prostitute who sits by many waters. Going on to verse 15. Then the angel said to me, The waters you saw where the prostitute sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, and languages. Verse 18, the woman you saw is the great city that rules over the kings of the earth. So, in Revelation 17, 1, John saw a prostitute sitting on many waters. Now, this is not literal language. Later, John tells us that the harlot is a city that rules over the earth. We see this in verse 18. The water she, she sits on are peoples and multitudes and nations and languages. How do we know? Because we see this in verse 15. So the language of Revelation is figurative. It's not literal. Figurative language has a hidden meaning. It uses symbols, and each symbol represents something else. So in Revelation, the prostitute is a symbol for a big city, maybe Rome. As a prostitute leads people away from God into sin, Rome led people away from God. So John liked to use figurative language, and he used a lot of symbols. In fact, more than any other writer, John gives us the words of Jesus that have uh, figurative language. For instance, looking at John 6, 51 through 52, this is what we're told. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Then the Jews begin to argue sharply among themselves, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? So notice that the people got all upset over Jesus' words, right? This was pretty common. They, they, they liked to just, uh, they'd hear Jesus say something and then they'd just take their own spin on it and run with it, right? He had just fed them with literal loaves and fish. And so they thought that he wanted them to eat his flesh. But Jesus later told the disciples that this had a 
spiritual meaning behind it. That what he was saying wasn't being made plain to, to these people. So looking at John 6, 60 through 63, this is what we read. On hearing it, many of his disciples said, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? Aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, does this offend you? Then what if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? The Spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you, they are full of spirit and life. So Jesus wanted for everyone to receive him as the bread from heaven. The one that God sent to feed our spiritual hunger. And John records that people, even the apostles, often failed to interpret the words of Jesus correctly. They didn't discern that he was using symbolic language. So look what John wrote in chapter 11, verses 11 through 15. This is what he tells us. After he had said this, he went on to tell them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to wake him up. His disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get better. Jesus had been speaking of his death, but his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. So when he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead, and for your sake, I'm glad I was not there so that you may believe, but let's go to him. So Jesus used figurative language in John 11, 11. He said, Lazarus is asleep, right? In this case, sleep was a symbol for death. But the disciples did not interpret the words of Jesus correctly. They thought that if Lazarus was asleep, well, then he'll, he'll get to feeling better. He'll wake up and he'll be on his merry way, right? We see this in verse 12. Since they did not understand the figurative language, Jesus spoke to them plainly. Lazarus is dead, right? Like, you didn't get what I said, so let me just tell you as plain as day. Lazarus is dead. We see this in verse 14. So now that we have an idea of what literal and figurative language is, Let's start discerning between the two, right? So it's important to remember that Scripture has only one meaning, okay? So it can either be literal or figurative. Don't interpret a verse in two different ways, right? Don't read the passage about Eutychus falling asleep and Paul rambling on through the night, don't read that and say, that's what happened, but now let me look for the, the secret things within it, right? We don't do that. If a verse uses plain language, interpret it in a plain way. If a verse has symbols, then interpret the symbols. But how do you know whether a verse is using plain language or symbols, whether it is literal or whether it is figurative? Well, we're going to look at three rules that will help us to determine which one it is. So rule one is always try to interpret a verse in a plain, direct, literal way first. When the plain, literal message of the Bible makes sense, then we don't have to search out another meaning. If the first method makes sense, just accept the verse as plain and direct. They, they were gathered together. They were having the Lord's Supper. Paul was preaching. He was, he was leaving the next day, so he, he had a lot he wanted to tell them. He started preaching through the night. Eutychus fell asleep, he fell out the window, he died, 
and God performed a miracle. Okay? So don't search for secret symbols and hidden meanings. In our everyday language, people don't intend for what they say to have more than one meaning. And, and this is, you know, this is one of those things where uh, text messaging has messed us up, I think, right? Because a lot of times we interpret what they say in a way that they never intended it, right? Uh, that's, that's why it, if it's like something really important, I'm just like, I'm going to just call them so that we can figure this out because I don't want them missing what I'm saying. If a man says that he rode a bus from the city to the village, what does it mean? He rode a bus from the city to the village, right? He doesn't desire for us to interpret his words to mean that he crossed over life's trials into the promised land, right? By bus. <laughs> so if you can interpret a verse literally, don't try to interpret it figuratively. Rule two, if the plain literal message does not make sense, then we look for symbols or hidden meaning or figurative language. So when the literal meaning of the word does not make sense, look for another way to interpret it. For example, Jesus said that the eye is the lamp of the body in Matthew 6.22. Now, it doesn't make sense to think of the eye as a literal lamp. So we realize that Jesus is using figurative language here. In Matthew 6.19 through 24, Jesus was talking to, uh, to his disciples about their relationship to wealth and to masters. He told them that their hearts, their inner desires, would be where they put their treasure. He also told them that they could not choose two masters. They must either choose God or choose money. So when our desires are to please God, we see clearly how to live in this world. But if our desire is to gain money then we will stumble over many things. If our eye or our inner desire is to please God, then our whole being will be filled with the light of his presence and he will guide us on the right path. What about Matthew 26, 26? There's been a long debate over Jesus's words, this is my body. Was the bread his body or did it represent his body? Uh, Luther insisted on a literal interpretation. At one discussion, he took a knife and he carved these words in Latin on the table, this is my body. Others, myself included, believe that the bread is a symbol for the Lord's body, right? We took communion this morning, right? We don't believe that it literally turns into the body of Jesus, right? But some do. So Jesus didn't grab his arm and say, this is my body. Rather, he was using the bread as a symbol to represent his body and the contents of the cup as a symbol of his blood. He was illustrating his, his body and his blood for them, right? Rule three, look for explanations in the context. So many times the Bible tells us whether the language is literal or uses symbols. So in Matthew 13, 24, this is what Matthew wrote. Jesus told them another parable. The word parable tells us that there's a hidden meaning in the story, right? Uh, in Daniel 2, Daniel tells us that Nebuchadnezzar had a dream to interpret. So we know that there are symbols in the verses from the dream, right? There was things in the dream 
that Nebuchadnezzar had that represented other things, and Daniel interpreted those for him. John often explained that Jesus used symbols like the temple, living water, bread, light, sheep, sleeping, a vine, and so forth. In these cases, John makes it clear to the readers that Jesus is using figurative speech and words as symbols with hidden meanings, right? That he's, he's telling parables and, and things like this. So when we twist the plain literal meaning, we have to realize something that that isn't anything new. This is something that's been going on for a long time. Twisting the plain, literal meaning of Scripture started long ago. Some people like to search for a hidden meaning in every verse of the Bible. In fact, they, they, just, they just sit there and just think up new ways to, to create new fantasies from these verses, right? During some of the dark periods in church history, people have misused the plain, literal truth of the scriptures. One teacher living a few centuries after the apostles could not accept the plain meaning of God's Old Testament commandments. God's direction to the Hebrews had been to eat only animals that had a divided hoof and chewed the cud. So this teacher, confused as he was, made an interpretation out of that commandment. Those who chew the cud are Christians who meditate on the word. I see the puzzled looks out there. The divided hooves means that the righteous walk in this world, but also look for the holy world to come. Chewing the could, I mean, it could, I guess, if, 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 if you really stretched it out there, it could be compared to meditating on Scripture. A Christian is a citizen of two worlds. That is true, but that isn't what Moses meant, right? That isn't what Moses meant when he wrote about animals with split hooves that chewed the cud. So it's dangerous to ignore just the very plain meaning of a verse and to search for hidden meaning, right? When we don't accept the natural plain meaning of a text, then we don't accept the word of God. When we preach and we teach a message other than the plain meaning of a text, we're not preaching God's word, but what our own imagination has told us, right? Again, we talked about those two words at the beginning of this class, eisegesis and exegesis, right? What is eisegesis? Putting what I want into the Bible, right? What's exegesis? Taking out what the Bible actually says and applying it to me, right? So God has promised that his word will inspire faith and that his word will not return to him void, but he has not promised to bless each person's wild interpretations. And, and this is the problem that you have with so many of these uh, teachers and that out there that, that do this is people listen to them and then they say, the Bible doesn't work, right? Uh, it, it, it doesn't work. It doesn't, it's, it's not what they, it, it doesn't work how they say because they're making stuff up. They're not telling you what the Bible actually says. So we are to interpret literal language in a direct way, discern the symbols in figurative language, and we can use the three rules here to interpret verses. So we've considered literal and figurative language. Literal language is plain, it is direct, it has no hidden meaning, so it's the easiest to interpret, right? But figurative language is harder to understand. It does use 
symbols and it does have hidden meanings. So we must spend more time studying it. So now let's look at some simple comparisons in interpreting figures of speech. So we're going to look at four kinds of comparisons that all use figurative language. And they are uh, similes, metaphors, anthropomorphism, and personification. So let's break them down one by one. A simile compares one thing with another, and it uses like or as between the two things. So John used similes to describe Jesus in Revelation 1.14. This is what he said. The hair on his head was white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. So we have his hair was like wool or snow, right? It's, it's comparing it. Uh, we also have his eyes were like blazing fire. Uh, a simile is a comparison that says A is like B. Okay? So Amos used a simile when he prophesied that God was about to judge the northern kingdom. This is what he said in Amos 2.13. Now then, I will crush you as a cart crushes when loaded with grain. Right? So A is like B. The length of a simile is short. It is one sentence or less. Sometimes a sentence can contain more than one simile, like Matthew 10, 16. I am sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore, be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. In Matthew eleven sixteen, Jesus asked a question. He said, to what can I compare this generation? And every Christian who desires to share the truth of God's word should ask themselves, what can I compare the truth I'm sharing to? How can I present the truth that I'm sharing? People like comparisons because they help them to understand stuff, right? We like examples. We like comparisons. So Jesus was the greatest teacher of all. In the Gospel of Luke, three out of every four words of Jesus are either a comparison or an illustration. And so we should learn to teach and preach and use, utilize comparisons to explain spiritual truths. Metaphors are like similes. Both of them compare two things, but a metaphor does not use the word like or as in comparison. A metaphor is direct. It states that A is B, okay? So A is not like B, A is B. Like a simile, a metaphor is usually only one sentence or part of a sentence. So let's look at a couple of examples of metaphors in the scriptures. First, Psalms 119 verse 105. Your word is a lamp for my feet, a light on my path. Here, the writer says that God's word is a lamp to his feet. In Matthew 5.13, Jesus uses a metaphor. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. So he was comparing Christians with salt. So the meaning would have been the same even if Jesus had used a simile and said, you are like the salt of the earth, right? Or even if the writer of Psalms 
would have said, your word is like a lamp to my feet, right? So we've looked at similes. We've looked at metaphors. This one's my favorite because I just love pronouncing it, anthropomorphism. This is a special type of metaphor that compares God to the form of humanity. And if you can't pronounce it, I'm going to make you write it a hundred times. <laughs> God is invisible, at least to the eyes that we have now. At times, we may wonder what we would see if we had spiritual vision. A vision like that which was granted to Elisha in 2 Kings 6, 16-17. Uh, this, is, this is one of my favorite passages. Well, I, lo I love the story of Elisha anyway. But here, they are, they're, they're being surrounded by an, an army, right? And, and his servant is freaking out. He, he's like, I, I, I don't understand what's going on. We're, we're surrounded. Well, how are we going to get out of this? And Elisha prays that God would open his eyes. And he saw all these armies of angels surrounding them. So don't be afraid, the prophet answered. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed, O Lord, open his eyes so he may see. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he looked and saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. How cool would that have been? Right? How cool would that have been? So God is spirit. He is not flesh. We are told this in John 4.24. Paul tells us that God is invisible and unable to be seen. In Colossians 1.15, he says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. Paul also declares in 1 Timothy 1.17, Now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. But does this mean that we can never see God as we are now, or that we will never see him for all of eternity. It's, it's hard for us as, as people, as physical people, to comprehend how spirits see and hear and think and feel and all of these things. Do they have any shape or form? How do angels and demons war against each other if they have no form? How can Satan be bound and kept in the abyss? If he has no form, do spirits have any type of spiritual mind, eyes, ears, feet, or hands? And a lot of these questions we don't understand and won't understand as long as we're here on earth, as long as we just know what we know here. When the Bible speaks of these things, of God's eyes and his ears and his face, it uses this type of language so that we as humans can relate to God who is spirit, right? It's so that we can know him more. But we want to be humble and we want to admit that we know very little about spirit things. If we could understand everything there was to understand about God, well, then he would be less than us, right? So did God allow Moses to see a temporary form in Exodus 33:23 or do spirit beings have a form we will one day see we we don't know quite what the answers are cuz we're not there we don't see these things yet but we do know that God is a person right that he is holy and he is truthful that he has feelings and he has emotions that he loves that he has mercy that he can be grieved and we also know that we are created in his image. In the future, we will know more than what we know now. John writes in 1 John 3, 2, Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Someday, we will see God face to face. This is what 1 Corinthians 13, 12 tells us. Until then, 
we may only wonder what passages like Psalms 34, 15, and 16 fully mean. It tells us, the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their cry. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil, to cut off the memory of them from the earth. So finally, there is personification. Now, personification compares things to a person. Okay? So, two types of examples follow. First, a deed, action, or idea is compared to a person. Looking at James 1.15, this is what we read. Then, after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, gives birth to death. So, in this verse, desire, sin, and death are all given the human attributes of conceiving, of giving birth, and growing, right? Furthermore, in Jeremiah 14, 7, we're told that our sins are said to testify against us. So a deed, action, or idea is compared to a person. And a thing is compared to a person. Let's look at one last example. In Matthew 6.34, Jesus says, Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. So Jesus referred to tomorrow as if it were a person. Tomorrow will worry about itself, right? This method of teaching calls attention to the lesson, and it helps others to learn and to remember it. So let's look at our homework right quick. First of all, there is a chart. You are to complete this chart stating whether a verse is literal or figurative. And there's one on there that's already done as an example for you. Then on the next one, state whether each verse uses a simile, a metaphor, anthropomorphism, or personification. So those are the two uh, things that you are to work on this week. Um, And then we will look at them at the beginning of our next lesson. So now let's just take a few minutes to review today's lesson before we head out into the darkness. (laughs) So what two types of rules does the Bible have? General rules and specific rules. General rules and specific rules. What is the purpose of the Bible? To clarify, not to confuse. What should you look for when interpreting a text? The plainest meaning, right? Don't dump your can of alphabet soup out and look for a meaning in it. Look for the plainest meaning. Define literal language. Literal language is plain, direct, common speech. What does figurative language have? Hidden meanings and symbols. Who, more than other writers, gave the words of Jesus that have a hidden meaning? That was John. What is the first rule of discerning between literal and figurative language? Always try to interpret a verse in a plain, direct, literal way first. What is the second rule of discerning between literal and figurative language? If the plain, literal message does not make sense, look for symbols or a hidden meaning. And remember, a lot of times it will tell you in the passage, like Jesus told them this parable, right? 
It'll tell you. What is the third rule of discerning between literal and figurative language? Look for explanations in the context. What does a simile do? It compares one thing with another using like or as between the two things. What are metaphors? It states that A is B, right? So not like, but is. What does anthropomorphism do? Other than twist my tongue. It compares God to the form of humanity. What does personification do? It compares things to a person.